Thank you um, for all of you staying and um, I feel a great pri privilege speaking to you today. Um, so I'm a bit of a late comer um, to this environment. So I, I feel like I'm like Alice in Wonderland peeking through the keyhole and find this wonderful world of very supportive people, wonderful academics, terrifically engaged clinicians, wonderful families who are doing their best for themselves and their, fa and their children. And it's, it's just so inspiring. So I would also thank you um, to you know, the, um, the low carb down under website. It's an incredible resource for our patients and for myself personally. So I really want to kind of start with a thank you. Um, so I am doing a PhD. I'm doing a PhD because I realise that my work um, is probably misguided. Um, so as an endocrinologist, I am the enemy. Um, I have been the person who, well, I don't think I ever really kind of engaged in the guidelines in the way that I probably ought to have. Um, but I am the person who has learnt very little nutrition as a medical student and then as an endocrinologist we really focus on medications and insulin and really pass over the nutrition aspects to our dietitian colleagues. Um, although the most common question my patients will ask me is what to eat, how to exercise, when do I sleep, all of those questions are far more important and you know that if you do those things your glucose control, your diabetes, your health outcomes are far better than any of the medications medications that I could offer you anyway. So my PhD, my children asked me, why are you doing all this extra work, Mum? We, you know, we, shouldn't you just go to work and do what you, like you've always done? And I said, well, I think I haven't done my job well enough, so I need to learn how to do it better. So that's what I'm doing. Right. And the back to the future aspect of this, of course, is really talking about the way we knew about low carbohydrate and a high fat diet historically in the pre-insulin era, but it actually refers back to my year 10 assignment. I look back um, and realise that I'd written a whole essay on um, healthy eating and, um, and, you know, Hippocrates and Galen and all the, um, the ideas about eating well to live well. So I think I'm actually turning my own uh, future back to where I started. So, so here we are. So type 1 diabetes, I know a lot of you in the audience are very familiar with type 1 diabetes, but those of you who aren't, I want to run through a little bit of type 1 diabetes and it affects a lot of people in, in Australia. So roughly a tenth or 10% uh, um, or 15% of all diabetes, depending on where you look for the data. And you can see that the, um, the likely um, incidence is in that early age group. So the highest um, group that's the highest incidence is um, adolescent and boys um, and then you can see that the rate of, of, um, of prevalence and incidence declines as, as, um, as the years pass. Um, so we've heard a lot about um, insulin and beta cells and islet cells so I'm going to take you through a little cartoon here just to remind you because it's not just about insulin and we're increasingly interested in the role of glucagon and that's going to become relevant at the end of my talk um, when low carb um, advice doesn't always go to plan so I want to talk to you about that but the beta cells are in blue and that represents the um, blue cells in the collection and the red cells are your alpha cells which are creating glucagon so that's a normal islet cell and due to the autoimmune nature of diabetes you lose all of those blue cells so the beta cells are deteriorated um, and so they've, they're no longer functioning but you can see this, the remaining alpha cells and in fact in early type 1 diabetes the alpha cell population increases and so it actually um, increases and the, the role of, of glucagon is going to be more important um, in the early part of, of type 1 diabetes. So the beta cells diminish and with that the alpha cells are no long, longer under control from glucagon so they proliferate and surge and there's actually quite an interesting response of glucagon to dietary intake um, which is not um, reflected in normal human, normal human physiology. And that's where we get the hyperglycemia. And increasingly, we recognise that glucagon plays a really important role in postprandial hyperglycemia and DKA. All right, so we, we've seen some pictures already about the pre-insulin era. And you can see on the left-hand side, this um, Teddy Ryder back in the early 20s. Um, this is him with uncontrolled type 1 diabetes. And he was following the Allen diet that we heard about earlier. Um, but with the, with the commencement of insulin, you can see that he's gained um, a good amount of weight. Looks quite happy on whatever that is. Um, and the lack of insulin, of course, leads to high glucose levels. And that spills into the urine. So it leads to the glu um, glucosuria and weight loss, which, as 
you know, is fat and muscle, um, and without insulin, it is uh, a life-threatening well, it's a, a disease. But in 1922, actually, the introduction is 1923, but the, in, the invention and the cure, um, the idea that a cure is broadcast in the news um, quite happily, I think we're um, maybe a little ahead of ourselves, but there's the insulin, the vials, and I have one patient who's had type 1 diabetes for 60 years, and she brings in her pictures and the actual insulin that she used back in the 1960s in her glucose book um, and this it looks like a torture um, device with this gun that she used and it created all sorts of lipoatrophy and lipohypertrophy in the skin over her um, her leg um, so, but of course, we're so much better now, aren't we? We've got all these wonderful technologies. We've got pumps, we've got insulin, a whole range of pens that you can use, continuous glucose monitoring. Surely it's all going better. Um, but you know um, it's not so easy. And we know that 84% of, of um, in looking at data internationally, 84% of people with type 1 diabetes do not achieve glucose targets. Um, and this is... Uh, a reflection of all the dreadful complications and we classify them as micro and macrovascular complications and we'll dutifully look for them in the clinic. We ask about them uh, in the clinic and aim to try and offset or prevent these um, but I'm not sure we're particularly successful. Um, and you know it's a, a very disheartening um, statistic looking again internationally and there's um, a recent um, uh, data set and it was a Swedish data set looking at the actual life expectancy um, in that group and it's diminished by eight up to 18 years. Now that's in Sweden. In Toowoomba I think it's a lot more than that and I think this is what's motivating me. I've got a young woman who's 23 who I'm waiting to die from her 10 years of type 1 diabetes. I've got, um, we've done a, a we've um, helped in the care of patients having amputations in their 20s in the last month so it's not only disheartening to you but it's incredibly devastating for us as well. And this is really confronting. So this is a very um, thorough data set um, from this Swedish group. And they found that the highest likelihood of cardiovascular disease is amongst young women, um, those who are diagnosed before the age of 20. Um, and it's certainly high for men as well, but um, it's, it's really prominent in that age group. And whether it re reflects that early life experience of hyperglycemia that you never really recover from, um, it's, it's up to for, for discussion. So we've heard already about the DCCT trial. So this is the big one that guides all of our type 1 diabetes management. And what this graph is reflecting is the fact that your likelihood of developing these dreadful complications increases with HbA1c. Um, and it's not a direct relationship, it's an it's a exponential relationship. Um, so the likelihood of developing these progressive um, complications increases with HbA1c. So this is where all of our target is, is lowering glucose levels and HbA1c. Um, but you know that we're not aiming for as low as some of you are getting. So we're aiming for HbA1c. So ours is either 6.5% or 7%, but we want it getting it low without the risk of hypoglycemia. So that's clearly what you've all been wor worrying about. And it's taken some time for, um, as clinicians, for us to recognise the danger of, of um, hypoglycemia with a number of type 2 diabetes diabetes studies. Um, but in the DCCT, at least 50% had severe hypoglycemia over the course of one year, and it, um, getting a very intense glucose lowering with um, multiple injections was associated with a threefold increase in hypoglycemia. Um, and that seemed to be in the little byline at the end. It wasn't really something that people were paying attention to, um, and weight gain being a significant increase in those people using more insulin frequent injections. So but that still guides us, we still go for it. We work hard on um, managing insulin and as doctors we work really hard at that. Um, and then we pass you over to the dietitian who talks about medical nutrition therapy. Um, and I'm really not sure what that means exactly. And um, so I thought, well, I need to get, I'm part of medical, so I'll do my PhD into nutrition. I think that would be good. Um, so I'm getting involved in the medical aspect of it. For me, I think of food hormonally, so I want to reflect on that as we go along. But the medical nutrition therapy, you know that um, the recommendations on the NH and MRC, which is the picture in the corner there, uh, recommends an awful lot of carbohydrates. So at least 45% is what we aim for. So we can give you as much carbohydrate through the day, spread across the day, so you're not having hypoglycemic events due to the insulin um, and to supply that beautiful brain that needs at least 130 grams a, a day, according to um, historical studies, but it's just been maintained through the ages. 
Um, and we really want you to choose as long as you have enough carbohydrate. And we want you to self-manage as long as you have our insulin and take our carbohydrate prescription seriously. <laughs> so it only works if you do that. So, so and so that's um, and in the ADA, the recommendations, as we've heard, have actually diminished. So it allows you to have some freedom with your carbohydrate intake. But as long as it's above 130 grams per day, Australia, we haven't gone so far as to that. But there is the document um, that I'll allude to um, that was released in August um, saying it's actually not a bad idea for those who are interested, but we're not endorsing it specifically. So, so. Looking for those people, you know, going back to our insulin profile. So if you have your normal basal insulin over the course of the day, and I'm just doing it in cartoons, so not so beautiful as, as we've seen with those curves. Um, but every time you eat a meal, you'll have a bolus of, of um, insulin, your pancreas create um, releases, and it's matched to the amount of carbohydrate and protein that you're eating. Um, and of course, when you have diabetes, you are insulin deficient, um, and that's in type 1 diabetes is absolutely deficient, in type 2 diabetes it's relative deficiency according to what you need um, to manage your glucose levels. Um, and the difference between those two lines of course relates to the hyperglycemia that you observe. Um, and as management we'll give you a basal insulin once a day or twice a day depending um, and then the rapid insulin is then of course matched so beautifully um, to the food that you eat. So because you're calculating tightly, you're making sure the carbohydrates perfectly matched, it should all go to plan. And of course, if you ever check your glucose levels after eating, you know that it doesn't work out so well. Um, and so you're going to um, have a mismatch between what your body would like to be making and what we're actually delivering you with that insulin injection. So you get um, the hypoglycemia that happens after meals, but you won't know if you don't look. Um, and that's what we actively tell you. There's probably no reason to look. And if you look at these, <laughs> <laughs> carbohydrate counting um, algorithms and the, um, the, the courses that will dutifully set up for you, you're actively told not to check. And this of course is what's happening. So I have a, this is um, reflective of a patient I have and he was checking his glucose levels before every meal beautifully. And if you can see the time, this is a continuous glucose monitor um, that's trying to, it gives you for every day, um, it's a, a different color and it maps it out from midnight at the left side all the way through the course of the day on the right hand side. And you can see that if you check your glucose levels, for him it was before seven o'clock and it's quite perfect. He checks it again at about lunchtime, which is around about one o'clock you can see it's quite perfect there as well um, so he's got absolutely no idea why he's so tired and we have no idea what's going on his HbO and C is 6.9 percent it makes no sense there must be something crazy so we've been very lucky at our hospital um, they've funded us to have continuous glucose monitoring you know for this clinical scenario um, for patients who otherwise don't have access to it and we make decisions based on the continuous glucose monitoring and I've been told that our hospital was the first to really implement that more than any other hospital hospital in their clinic and it's completely invaluable to me but what what do I do oh, I change the insulin I change the insulin doses um, and so then I had a revelation and I'll show you what happened next um, so as I say carbohydrate counting um, you go and meet the diabetes educator you follow the intent and it's um, very resource intensive so we don't have a carbohydrate counting course set up for patients um, specifically because um, our dietitians um, we weren't funded enough to have a sufficient dietitian support for that but a lot of our patients probably don't ha enjoy the health and numeracy um, or the health literacy to achieve that so it wasn't taken up but you can look at calculators and apps um, and this I find really interesting and I think you I think if you've ever been to the course that I'm alluding to um, you might recognize this so the whole idea it used to be a lamington um, for, for Australia so um, like what you eat eat what you like and I have had that come out of my mouth and I'm embarrassed to say that um, because it clearly isn't the right message at all so when, I, when in doubt, I think, what would Jackie Chan think? Um, and so this is what my patients look like when we talk about you know, carbohydrate counting um, and the, the you know, disappointment in patients where it obviously doesn't work. And then they just don't turn up. And I've had one patient tell me, Sheila, the reason I don't turn up is I get so anxious, I'm vomiting the, night, the day before, um, and then I, I just can't turn up, I'm so sick. So 
Um, but at least she told me that, so we reflected on that together. Um, but that is a big problem. We've, our fail to attend rate is very high. It's getting better because of, I think, some of the changes we're making. Um, but we know that if you do attend a very expensive um, program for carbohydrate counting, the best you can do is get an HBO and C drop by 1%, um, and they're very proud of that. Um, those groups, not the patients. Um, the, but the inaccuracy we know worsens as your carbohydrate intake increases um, and the, the threshold, we actually recommend three serves of carbohydrates per meal. So you can see that um, accuracy is going to deteriorate. Um, and this is really a blame and shame exercise, don't you think? Those of you I can see nodding. Um, when you're working so hard to get it right and it just doesn't work. So what do we do as clinicians? We blame you. Okay, so I just wanted to share with you the enlightenment. So this is when I um, realised that I was completely wrong and I felt that there was another way to approach this. So um, her name is not actually Mandy, uh, but she's a personal trainer. Um, and the importance of that is relevant when she can't run because the pain in her feet is so bad that she can't run. So the painful peripheral neuropathy had been so dr distressing to her. Um, despite the fact she'd had an HbA1c of 6.9%, we just you know, thought, well, just keep going, you can do this. Um, and of course we do the continuous glucose monitor. This might be familiar, um, this was hers. Um, and you can see how much time she spends overnight dipping into hypoglycemia and then rebounding up. Um, and she was working very hard to get this right. And, it's, um, and the only time that her glucose levels actually smooth out is when she's fasting, um, which she, she did that herself so that she wouldn't have terrible glucose levels during her work day. So that's pretty dreadful. Um, and then the next time she came to see me, um, she, we did another continuous glucose monitor um, for her. And you can see it looks vastly different. And she said, Sheila, I think you're wrong. I thought I'd just change everything myself. I joined this new Facebook group and I've got this new book. Um, <laughs> and she, she tried to share it with me. I'm going, oh, that's nice. Um, <laughs> bam, bam. So her HBO and C of 6.2% obviously a big achievement for her but the most important thing the most compelling thing for me is she's a different girl so her foot pain had completely resolved she was back running and working every day she was back working and not having sick days and she actually had decided she was going to um, go back to university because she'd never entertained that idea um, because she was so unreliable as a young person with terrible glucose control that she thought she'd miss out on uh, a career like that. So her frozen shoulder, which she was just about to have operated on, disappeared. Um, the pain disappeared, the shoulder stayed. Um, <laughs> But the thing that was interesting to her is the weight gain was really concerning. So she decided to flip it. Um, so there's her, her meal. So she asked, I asked her what she ate and it sounded pretty good. Um, and then she went high fat and it smoothed out further. Her HBO and C came down further and she actually lost that weight further. And um, so she, this is what she's having and I, I can see that you're um, familiar with that kind of a diet. I can't quite come at the butter in coffee, but um, I'm happy to learn. Um, but cream certainly is part of our life. All right, but she's no longer a brittle diabetic, and that's what, that was in her words. She's no longer a brittle diabetic. Her family don't get in trouble all of the time, and she just feels like she's got a whole life to lead, um, which is such a wonderful experience to observe this. And for me, it was a case of just being quiet and listening, um, which I think all doctors, we should do more of that. So this is me looking through the world with different eyes. And so I, I, go, I drive my kids to school and I'm telling them all the time I go to school going, I think I know how to do my job now. I have a feeling I'm, the right, I'm on the right track and I've got these new ideas I want to share with you. So my poor kids hear about it all day long. <laughs> So, and of course, um, this is required reading in our diabetes team. Um, and even if it's not low carb, it's such a wonderful resource to teach you about type 1 diabetes or just general diabetes. So it's been a complete game changer for our team to learn about that. And um, I had the privilege of um, being allowed onto type 1 grit um, to um, embark on my research project. And of course, those who, of you are already aware of this, but um, the recommendations are aiming for 30 grams a day of carbohydrate um, and having a self-management textbook. And that's really what this is. It's very dense, um, but it's very minute and practical details. It's terrific. And specific instructions on insulin, which I find really important. But from the Facebook community, uh, it's a real game changer for people in the bush who have no community, who have no idea that other people are suffering like they are. Um, and you can get an answer from over the other 
other side of the world, if you're waking up at two o'clock and you want an answer, it's there for you. Um, and I think these people are very, I think you all are very savvy. Um, and as doctors, when I talk about these Facebook communities, there's the typical poo-pooing that I hear um, that old oh, Dr. Google wouldn't know. So. Of course, that's not true. So now we knew about um, low carbohydrate diets. So this is um, that dates back to 1920 um, and the high fat diet. And what was really interesting to me when I read this is with a high fat diet, um, this is people with type one diabetes succeed in rendering and keeping every patient free of sugar in the urine. This is a, a case series of seven. Um, and the other part of the discussion I thought was really interesting, unde undoubted desirability of omitting carbohydrates. Um, so that was in the, in the discussion of this paper which I thought was very interesting. Um, and um, in the absence of insulin, so this is 1920, um, they were practicing fasting um, so that you weren't you know, tipping over into DKA with so much fat. So. Um, and this is a diet um, promoted by um, Frederick Allen. Um, so the idea that you're cutting down carbohydrates, this would all be familiar to you as well. And interestingly, I've had a few patients who've gone to the um, hospital um, museum and found historical hospital menus around um, rural Australia. Um, and, and they're remarkably similar. Um, so that was pre-1977. Um, and I have patients who I'm now giving Kellyan awards to, so 50 years of diabetes or older, and they all practice this. Um, and yet all the people who are diagnosed after 1977 are having those complications. So. All right, so here are some that you could go all over the world and find these low carbohydrate diets, but there's a whole range of them that I just I tripped over um, as in looking for this, but the idea that um, it's been known about in the pre-insulin era. So I think that idea that pharmaceutical companies are in, the, in on the game, I think has been around for a long time. So, and we alluded to this before, so this is a, um, a study that was published this year and it looked at this particular t um, type 1 grit Facebook group and some of you in the audience would have already seen this. Um, so it was an online survey trawling for people who are part of this um, very important and um, influential community um, and they looked at what they were practicing. So children constitute 131 um, participants and these were the parents speaking on behalf of the kids um, and you can see that mean HbA1c across the group is um, remarkably low um, but with, with impressively low rates of DK and, and hypoglycemia um, reported in this group so very impressive um, and again looking at that that um, the Dr. Bernstein's diet is the, the inspiration. So what do I do? Well, I decided to do the same thing, although I didn't realise this um, study was already in the pipeline when we embarked upon this. And I have to say, those people in the audience who I know have been part of this um, study with me, um, it was an absolute honour to spend the time speaking to all of these people. Um, so I interviewed 36 people for this, and it was the best learning curve I've ever had. So it trumps anything I've done um, in terms of my own self-education. Uh, so I, I thank all of you um, from the bottom of my heart. Um, and as a doctor, we don't actually get to hear from our patients in the great depth that I heard from these people. They had no reason not to really tell me what they really thought, so that was terrific. Um, so again, similar age um, spread, so 45 years with a long duration of diabetes and their daily carbohydrate was, was exactly the same as the previous study and the duration of low carbohydrate diet you can see is three and a half years. But what I'm going to show you is the data for those people who changed down um, from a normal, to, uh, normal kind of a standard diet to a low carbohydrate diet. So you can see this is HbA1c on the usual diet, dropped down from 7.9%, significantly down to 5.7%, again, similar to our other study. And you, this other um, is representing, um, on the right, the chart is demonstrating that 100% of these people experienced a drop in HbA1c, and it was maintained over the course of their entire um, low-carb experience. And you just don't see that, do you? Um, and again, the insulin doses also decreased. And on the left-hand side, it's um, the total daily dose. And the basal insulin, I was interested to see, it did drop down as well across this group. But the most um, important drop was in the bolus doses, down to very low dose um, for carbohydrate. Um, and the lipid profile, um, I've said it's unchanged, but it's, it, um, there was an improvement. And again, as we heard from um, Professor um, um, Sakaris, we've got a, a drop in um, triglyceride. We're not going to worry about the cholesterol, um, but there was not a significant increase in the HDL. But these are only small numbers, so um, we'll wait and see. 
So in terms of the survey, everyone was so excited. Um, so they all were happy with their glucose. They didn't have um, as many hypos, and that's that drop in insulin, um, and are more confident. And the health outcomes were outstandingly impressive. So energy levels, weight management for those who wanted to lose weight, um, and their appetite was satisfied in 100%. And 83, I thought was interesting. So some would prefer to have some more bread from time to time, but they didn't go there. Um, but what was interesting, the difficulties of restaurants going out is hard, you know that. Um, some people found it was more expensive, but not as much as I was led to believe by the doctors who talk about this, um, the naysayer doctors. Um, and there was a bit of difficulty in choosing what to eat, but um, the biggest problem was dealing with the diabetes team. Um, and, and that led to withdrawal from care in 83%. And what was interesting for me is the GPs looked pretty good to me. So the, I asked each participant, you know, what, what was the experience? And I just had open questions for them to tell me what they really thought. So endocrinologists, there's a few key people, and presumably um, they've been onboarded by some of our research participants, um, were quite happy. But by and large, the endocrine community is incredibly negative. Um, and I actually had some emails from other overseas people who wanted to be part of the study who kind of were desperately saying, I can't even get an insulin prescription because in the US, if I say I'm going low carb, they tell me to leave the room. Um, so, I, yeah, it's really challenging. Um, the dietitians, um, a lot of these people weren't even seeing dietitians to tell me um, what their recent experiences were, but they were pretty clear they weren't going back. Um, which is again very disappointing. But the GPs most of the time were saying, I don't know, you could teach me. How about we all read the book? And it was really interesting, that idea that the expert knows everything versus the GP who's your life coach. I thought that was a really helpful dynamic for me as a uh, hospital clinic to discharge those patients back to the GP because they're gonna do a whole lot better with them. Um, so, and to recognise where I sit in their life you know, that as a specialist, specialist, um, yeah, I'm not nearly as important as um, Dr. Bernstein, the Facebook group, and um, a helpful, loving GP. So, all right. And I, I did present that, that data at our Australian National, the Australian Diabetes Society meeting um, in August, and. Um, and it was interesting, most of the people um, I spoke with, so there were professors of, of medicine and, and um, endocrinologists who were very interested in what this told them. Um, and there was one person who came and he's some, someone who's very high up in research and he was really angry at me. And what was interesting, he said, this is such a simple thing. It should be something we should be, if it, was, if it worked, we would do it. Therefore, it mustn't work. <laughs> so, and, and he got really quite angry and I thought, well, at least he's paying attention to me. That's good. Um, so I don't think I'll be getting the funding from the Australian Diabetes Society, but I have had funding from our local foundation um, to do a randomised control study of, of, type one di of um, low carbohydrate diets in our population of type 1 diabetes. So I feel like very excited about our own local momentum that we're building in Toowoomba, so that's exciting. So, but there is a statement, and um, we mentioned that earlier, but it's, it's nice to see. So um, we recognise that some people with type 1 diabetes may choose to follow a low-carb eating approach, and they should be supported in this. So I think that's really important. It's movement in the right direction. And we encourage these people to consult their diabetes GP, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and t people with type 1 diabetes are at a high risk of hypoglycemia, which is not true if you are helped to reduce your doses and you know about carbohydrate properly and we've provided you the education that you actually need. So, so I'm going to just uncover, like pull back that carpet and look at what's underneath um, because I know you're all very keen on low carbohydrate diet and I am too, so that's what I'm saying. But I just want to let you know, I have a few patients where it hasn't gone so well and I wanted to really kind of learn what was going on for them. So I've found patients in my clinic who've given it a red hot go, they do it for a few weeks and then are really happy with the results. I've got one patient who was doing it for three months and then she got very stressed, so jats are her go-to, and she kind of said, I'll just have a jat from time to time, or sometimes I get really stressed and I'll have six. And what was happening, her sugars then were going up much more than I'd expect for a few jats. 
Um, and so she was experiencing significant sharp upswings in her glucose uh, and they were not coming down and she was then correcting and then hypoing later. And this is the pattern that I'm seeing in some of my patients who mix up a low carbohydrate diet with intermittent bursts. And I was trying to look at what is the what is the relationship there, and of course I need to go to physiology studies. There's not many, there's no type one diabetes studies. Um, so obviously we're looking for insulin resistance. But what I really I came as a student today to find out whether the very smart people could tell me the answer to this. So I, I was really looking into increase in hormone response, and I, this is how I now approach my diabetes care. But what was interesting, two of these um, patients um, actually told me that they had some carbohydrate and then flipped into DKA. And when they went to hospital, of course, they, we give um, you dextrose and then you get the hospital diet, which has got more carbohydrate than she was normally having. You know about it. Um, and she went back into DKA. So we treated her DKA and the hyperglycemia, the out of control glucose, I think was actually driven by that period of DKA, uh, the period of hospital high carbohydrate diet. And the weight gain, this same woman um, was then preparing for pregnancy and she was told to get off the low carbohydrate diet and reintroduce it. So she was going from 30 grams a day to 70 grams a day, which I think most people you know, in diabetes world will say that's still low carbohydrate, which fits the de definition. She gained five kilos in about two months and she's now insulin resistant back to her polycystic ovarian syndrome scenario and she's not able to fall pregnant. So it's really enticing to me what is happening because she's not eating that much more. The calorie intake was not changed. Um, and she is experiencing poor glucose control. So pardon my cartoon, I want to take you through this, but this is my, I, I just, I, I lie in bed wondering about this and I draw pictures and this is what I have. So when you've got your, um, uh, your starch is then broken down, as you know, into glucose and then glucose molecules are then absorbed in the small intestine by SGLT1. We heard about that uh, to a small um, extent earlier. So SGLT1 is the absorptive um, transporter, brings it across into the portal circulation and then you know that that gets either stored as hepatic glycogen or distributed as um, glucose for cells. So that's what we talk about with our patients but we completely forget the idea about incretin hormones. So these are the enticing ones for me. So the incretin hormones are hormones that respond to the food that you eat and they're all along your gut um, lining um, and the incretin hormones do switch. This is the connection between what you eat and your islet cell response, so your beta cell response um, and alpha cell response. So normally you'd be increasing insulin in response to the carbohydrate that you eat, but with type 1 diabetes and in fact with type 2 diabetes, you drive glucagon up even more so, so you upregulate this process. So you actually have this paradoxical increase in glucagon. Um, and Meanwhile, in the background, your incretin hormones are really sneaky, and there's one in particular I'm going to talk about, um, actually promote lipogenesis and promote um, uh, liver fat, um, fatty liver disease, inflammation, and actually disrupts appetite regulation. Um, and there's some interesting studies into bone turnover with these as well. So this is a complicated slide, but the idea that um, your intestine are up the top, um, all the way along, the epithelium is dotted along with um, endocrine cells, and these ones along the left-hand side are representing the different cells that are available at different points along your gut. Um, and the ones that are particularly relevant to carbohydrate are the ones, the K cells and the L cells, and the line kind of connects up. Your K cells are in the small intestine, so that's where your glucose, your soft drink, your rice, your potato, your lovely starches that get broken down really quickly are absorbed predominantly at the small intestine at the upper um, jejunum and then the L cells which are further down in the ileum and the colon so you actually have to have your carbohydrate hang around long enough to get down there to stimulate this. So the difference is the GIP which is this first one um, is released in the upper um, from the K cells in the upper part of the gut and directly stimulated by glucose to a lesser extent fat. Um, and if you eat um, a scone, you're going to have a rapid increase in your um, GIP within 15 minutes. And this is the time frame that that insulin's popping up. Uh, so the glucose levels are popping up for these patients. Um, and the fatigue, the bone wrenching fatigue they describe that lasts for some time. So I pres I, my thoughts, is that this is a GIP and glucagon response in response to carbohydrate. Whereas GLP-1, down the bottom, these are the ones we do like. GLP-1 is a, is a hormone that is stimulated predominantly by fat and protein and to a lesser extent the carbohydrate if it gets down there. <coughs> um, 
So the GIP, um, getting back to this one, so the GIP in type 1 diabetes stimulates your alpha cells more so because you don't have any insulin to regulate that. Um, and then this in itself, I think, is being um, promoted um, in people who are uh, following a low-carbohydrate diet. I'll come back to that. Um, but the, the hypoglycemia is, being, um, is probably a result of the glucagon and the GIP insulin resistance. But the GIP separately to all of that actually promotes visceral fat weight gain it and it increases splanchnic circulation so the blood supply to the fat so you increase this pathway um, we know that it increases lipogenesis within the liver and promotes fatty liver disease it increases hunger signaling um, in the hypothalamus and in itself is pro-inflammatory so it stimulates your macrophages to release all of these inflammatory cytokines um, and then that then can lead to insulin resistance and on the on the right hand side I've got a nice avocado to remind us that GLP-1 loves fat um, and is, is, um, stimulates insulin in, a, in health, but in type 1 diabetes, um, obviously it's not available, but actually suppresses that glucagon response. And it does some beautiful things about suppressing appetite and inflammation. So that's the one we really like. So what's interesting at this, getting to the K cell, and this is the, um, the, the blue center is representing the K cell. So the endocrine response to the food is driven by this cell. And you can see uh, alongside it, the glucose uptake is, um, is within the epithelial separately. So the SGLT1 on the epithelial surface is driving this process, both in the K cell and in your epithelial cell. But what's interesting about fat is if you have a high fat diet and you've got bile salts sitting around there, the fat in the diet probably promotes the uptake and, uh, and increase this GIP response when you actually do eat carbohydrate. So it seems that the fat primes the K cell to respond um, to that pathway. So it increases. So in the patients that I'm observing, they're not eating many more calories and they're only having a small amount of carbohydrate, yet their glucose response is much wilder than they've ever experienced on a, a more, you know, a lower kind of, um, a, you know, a higher carbohydrate diet. So this is the downside that we're grappling with. And this is a rodent study that kind of represents that. So in the, um, in the white boxes, that's a, a low fat diet. So these are, uh, rats have been running around um, for, a num for up to 12 weeks um, on a low fat diet. And then they give them a glucose tolerance test and their GIP goes up, but not nearly as high as the high fat diet fed rodents. So the GIP response seems to be exaggerated by the high fat diet, both acutely and in the, in the follow ups and the longer term feeding. So how do we approach this? So clearly we have patients who um, are wanting to change their diet and low carbohydrate as an option. We're happy to support them in that. Um, at no point are we pushing it, but we you know, are there to kind of support the idea behind it. But for those people who have slips, and I think this is the real learning pathway for me, if people have a carbohydrate slip, um, they actually need to prepare a bolus ahead of time. So it's probably half an hour ahead of it and that they aim for low GI. So at least you get some of that carbohydrate down to you know, the GLP-1, but obviously um, we all are a bit um, suspicious of GI, um, but to know the consequences. And if there's something that's gonna motivate you to stay into, in low carbohydrate, it's that awful bone wrenching um, fatigue that you get. Um, and so for some of our patients, a very low carbohydrate diet is not going to be really a, an option because of that. Um, but one thing I'm very proud of, and this is our hospital, um, you know, the things that we're doing locally um, and our CEO, Peter Gillies, is in our audience, um, who's been a huge champion for this. But um, I feel like my life's work can be defined by this experience. Um, our hospital menu has switched off sugar. There is no sugar. <laughs> And some of our patients are so poor, like we have some very poor, patient, poor patients. For them to have a cooked breakfast is probably the first time they've had that. So they've never really experienced it. So that role modeling in the hospital has been a very positive experience. And I think anecdotally our, our um, team have recognized we're not having as many extra doses of insulin on the wards as we used to on Kellogg's Corn Flakes. So. <laughs> so that's been a win as well. All right, so thank you.